Welcome on this first Sunday of Christmas and the last Sunday of the year. We thought perhaps we should explain why we still call this Café Praise, even though we are now recording in the Lady Chapel. It's now nearly a year since we led our familiar Café Praise in the meeting room. Not only do we miss the relaxed atmosphere with coffee and cakes, but what we miss most of all is your company and the lively discussions which were so important to all of us. So we persist in heading the service on the fourth Sunday of the month as Café Praise, in the firm hope that sometime in the next few months we will be able to resume that kind of service. However, today, for a change, we're just going to reflect on the season with readings, prayers and hymns. Thanks to Alex for recording this and to Paul and the choir for the music. We will open with a carol once in Royal David City. collect for the first Sunday of Christmas. Almighty God, who wonderfully created us in your own image, and yet more wonderfully restored us through your Son, Jesus Christ, grant that, as he came here to share in our humanity, so we may share the life of his divinity, who is alive and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, 
now and forever. Amen. The reading this morning is from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 2, verses 15 to 20. When the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let us go now to Bethlehem and see this thing that has taken place, which the Lord has made known to us. So they went with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the child lying in a manger. When they saw this, they made known what had been told to them about this child. And all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds told them. But Mary treasured all these words and pondered them in her heart. The shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen, as it had been told to them. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. God. Uh, thanks for the reading, Steve. It's easy to forget that at the time of Christ's birth, Bethlehem was positively heaving with people. So many people that there was no room at the inn. The normal population had swelled with people returning to Bethlehem to be registered for the census ordered by Emperor Augustus. There must have been wealthy merchants, civic dignitaries, government officials, oh, lots of them, high priests, in fact, many that will be considered the great and the good amongst the mass crowds just outside the stable, in the street just outside, within touching distance, but totally unaware of the significance of the event that had taken place inside. Any one of them could have been the first visitors to the new baby. But God did not choose any of them to be the first visitors to his son. Instead, he chose shepherds from the hills outside, smelly, dirty, scruffy shepherds, outsiders in any polite society, ostracized by many. It was these people, not some high-class citizens who were chosen by God to be the first to know of and see the arrival of his son. Perhaps this is a sign of the life of Jesus to come when he would befriend outsiders and many who have been forgotten or considered unworthy of notice by society and even by the priests or ought to have known better. This poem that I'm about to read, And There Were Shepherds by Ken Taylor, shows the link not just between shepherds and God on the night the angels came, but between the good shepherd and us, the sheep who he knows by name. And there were shepherds. Of course there were shepherds in this tale, there had to be. Moses was a shepherd, and Christ is greater than Moses. David was a shepherd, and this new king of David's line is far greater than David. Israel was a shepherd people, and this surprising shepherd king will found a new Israel. Of course there were shepherds, for they live close to the earth, knowing its turning times, and care for its creatures. And those are they who may catch a glimpse of his glory. Of course there were shepherds, for this is the good shepherd, who will lay down his life for the sheep. He comes to the rescue when you get yourself in a tangle, and sets himself between you and danger. He knows your name, calls you by name, expects you to follow his call, and he will lead you to better pastures than you have yet known. Let us join with the choir in singing our next hymn, While Shepherds Watched.
Penny and I have been reading a book by Caris Welsh, currently a curate at All Saints Kettering, but previously a tutor in Christian spirituality at St Melissa's College, London. She has guided a walk through Advent with the poems of R.S. Thomas, a Welsh priest and poet. Jenny is going to read the very first poem in the book. This poem is the one that has stayed with me more than any other and has meaning far beyond Advent. The Coming <clears throat> And God held in his hand a small globe. Look, he said. The sun looked. Far off, as though through water, he saw a scorched land of fierce colour. The light burned there. Crusted buildings cast their shadows. A bright serpent, a river, uncoiled itself, radiant with slime. On a bare hill, a bare tree saddened in the sky. Many people held out their thin arms to it, as though waiting for a vanished April to return to its crossed boughs. The sun watched. Then, let me go there, he said. We have been on a journey throughout Advent towards the birth of Christ. We have looked through our human eyes at what has taken place, rejoiced outwardly and thought inwardly of the meaning of Christ's birth for us. This poem marks both the ending and the beginning of the journey before us. It leads us towards the crucifixion, but also heralds the coming of Christ into our troubled world, drawn into the heart of humanity. Rather than contemplating Christ coming from our own perspective, we are given the vantage point of the God who gazes lovingly on us from out of time. I love the beginning of this poem the intimacy between father and son. And God held in his hand a small globe. Look, he said. The coming invites us into a God's eye view of the world and towards a particular place and time as the father and son look together, far off as through water, at a broken earthly landscape. And together they see where the sun's coming is to take place, where his ending, which is not an ending, will interrupt and agitate the story of God's people. The sun is not invited to look at a rich and fertile place or a prosperous terrain, but rather at a scorched land with its crusted buildings. And it is slime rather than the sun, which is radiant from the bright serpent of a river. The landscape suggests the landscape of the Holy Land, but it could be anywhere which has lost its power to bring life, ravaged by loss and pain and destruction. Does the bright serpent of the river radiant with slime evoke thoughts of a snake-ruined Eden and our human nature? We are reminded that we have a capacity for both sustaining and harming the great gift of God's creation. However, the poem also makes clear that hope stirs, and we are not alone. The human longing for redemption emerges as the poem pans down again to the earthly landscape. The vision changes, where the father invites the son to look at this place, where on a bare hill, a bare tree saddens the sky. There, the people are holding out thin arms to the tree, as though waiting for a vanished April to return to its cross boughs. The father says nothing. He only invites the son to look. He does not make him go. The poem continues. The son watched them. He saw the need of the people stretching out their thin arms and yearning for hope and a new life. It is only when the son sees his own future suffering in the crossed boughs of the tree that he responds. And he says simply, let me go there. 
Such is this intensity of love and compassion of God, Father and Son. The humanity that God has created needs renewal. It needed it then, and it needs it now. Christ coming to meet us in our humanity is completely wrapped up in his death so that we might return to God. The coming is an arc of life, death and life again, beginning with God's compassionate, loving response to humanity's need and yearning. With arms out, held out, we celebrated the first coming of Christ and we await the second coming. In yearning anticipation for the journey ahead, may we discover that the Christ who came to us in the depth of compassion meets with us and walks with us along the way through this time of expectant hope. The sun watched them. Let me go there, he said. How on earth do we repay such love? Let's join in singing O Little Town of Bethlehem. <laughs> as we continue to celebrate Christ's birth. We thank you for all clergy and laity who have in any way helped to make Christmas worship possible, though in many different forms. Bless us all and all those with whom we are celebrating God's gift of the Christ child this Christmas, whether they are far from us or near at hand. We thank you for those who have been able to meet with loved ones, and ask your loving support for those who haven't. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We thank you for all those who have been working over Christmas on our behalf and who have had little time to celebrate. Give them a time of rest, relaxation and renewal. 
Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And God held in his hand a small globe. We know, Lord, that you do hold the world in your hand, in all its brokenness. We pray for all those who are working in many places to bring relief for suffering and freedom from oppression. Strengthen them, encourage them, and preserve them from all danger. Lord, in your mercy, hear Amen. our prayer. We know there are many who, even as they rejoice at your birth, will be very sad today. Christ, Son of Mary, you were born into a human family. Give comfort to all who have no family, whose families are broken, or who, particularly at this time, feel the loss of loved ones. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for those who cannot now see the way ahead or any purpose in their lives and for the Samaritans and all other individuals and agencies who work to bring comfort and hope to such situations. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord, of our today and our tomorrows, we thank you for the year behind us. May all that was good in it remain with us, and may all that was harmful be left behind. In the year ahead, as a parish and as individuals, we shall face both challenges and opportunities. Show us how to use them to build our faith in you and in your purposes, through our worship, our study, and our service of each other and of our community. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And now let us join in Jesus' own prayer, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Um, our final hymn, which you can, we can all join in with singing with the choir, is O Come, O Come, Emmanuel.
Jesus Christ, you have put your life into our hands. Now we put our lives into yours. Take us, renew us, and remake us. What we have been is past. What we shall be through you still awaits us. Lead us on. Take us with you. Amen. Amen. And may God the Father bless us. God the Son defend us. God the Spirit keep us. Now and forevermore. Amen. Amen.